words matter. We uh, have been in a series this, uh, the beginning of this year uh, on focus and the importance of focusing. We talked about focusing on God's word. In other words, let the same word of God that framed and organized the world we live in frame and organize your life. And then we talked about uh, focus on your inner life, living from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And then the third part of that series was focus on your words because your words matter. And it had, it's kind of so resonated with so many of us that we've just kind of paused here and uh, a one part became a four part and a sub-series within a series. And so we're on that last part uh, of your words matter. Focus on your words. And um, part one of that was basically, you know, understanding that... Uh, Life and death are in the power of the tongue, uh, as Proverbs 18 says it. Life and power, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit, all right? And so those who love to speak, you will eat the fruit of what comes out of your mouth. And we should love to speak, and I want to talk about that this morning. Um, Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and, you know, the Lord told Moses, he said, listen, I have set before you life and death. Now choose life, all right? So we have a mandate. We have a mandate as followers of Jesus. We have a mandate to declare life, right? Jesus, or I think it was Paul, he said, let your words, let your words always be seasoned with grace. Always. We have a mandate to declare life. Part two, we talked about how words are empowered by the spirit behind those words. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. What spirit is on your words, right? And we should have faith and love are the things that should be empowering our words. That was part two. And then part three last week, we talked about how one of the consistent messages in the Bible is that God wants to work in and through you. It is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. And we know that, listen, God can do things with or without us. But if that's how you're going to live your life, you're, 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 that's a low probability way of living your life because, yes, God can do things without your cooperation. And sometimes he does that. Your own salvation kind of, you know, he, he didn't ask you, he didn't ask you to participate when he came and died for you and rose again. Now you do have to participate by saying yes though, all right? And so the, the, the message in the scripture is very clear that God wants to work in you and through you. It's God empowering you. It's God with you. There's a, there's a cooperation that, that the Bible calls faith, all right? The, the, that phrase, in Christ, I believe is used by Paul in his letters 160 times. And is that phrase, in Christ. You are in Christ. And uh, in, in his letter to the Ephesians, in the first 14 verses, he says it 11 times. It was so central to his message. Paul says, God is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure, okay? Um, And so this is, I mean, it's it's not like a message of God helps those who help themselves. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that that we want to cooperate with God, that he wants to actually do things. He wants to empower us, all right? Listen, when you're thinking stupid and acting dumb, God will sometimes work in your life anyways, all right? But that's not God saying, this is how I always want to do things with you, (laughs) okay? It's God reminding us that he loves us and it's an invitation to come back to him so we can do this a whole better way, (laughs) all right? All right, Uh, we've talked about Hebrews 11.1, faith is the substance. In other words, faith looks like something. Faith is not an idea, it's not just a theory. It actually looks like something. When you have faith, it drives, if you will, or it motivates the way in which you live. That's why the Bible says you are saved by the grace of God, which comes to you by faith, 
but you are judged by your deeds, by how you lived your life. It's not, now when the Bible says that, it doesn't mean that, you are, you're, that your eternal salvation is determined by your deeds. It just means when God wants to look and evaluate, that's what judge means, to look and evaluate and to, and to discern. That's what judge means. And if he wants to see the faith in your life, he's going to look at how you lived because how you lived is a reflection of what you really believe. It's easy just to talk. Right? We all know that words are just easy. You can say one thing and do something different, and what is it that actually matters? If I say one thing, if I tell my wife I love her, and then with my actions, I'm abusive, what message does she get? She correctly ignores the words. That was all leading up to where I wanted to go this morning, which is this, faith speaks. Faith speaks. So let's turn. I'm going to use the scripture from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the second letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Yeah. Woohoo! I got two woohoos. Yay. All right. Maybe by the end we'll get more. Amen. Paul says this. And he's writing to the Corinthians. He says, But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed. Therefore, I spoke. We also believe. Therefore, we also speak. Okay, and Paul is actually uh, quoting one of the Psalms. He's quoting Psalm 116. Beautiful Psalm. I highly recommend that you go and read that Psalm. It's a wonderful Psalm. And in that Psalm, David, uh, he is recounting, if you will. He's praying. He's worshiping, whatever. He's, he's, He's recounting some very difficult circumstances in his life. And he recounts how in that, in the midst of those difficult circumstances, he believed God. And because he believed God, he spoke. And he spoke thanksgiving, he spoke praise, and he spoke God's will over his life. And, he, and God delivered him through those difficult circumstances. And this psalm was written about that. And so Paul is quoting this psalm. And he says, just as David, when he was in the midst of affliction, he believed and trusted God. And therefore, he spoke out of that faith. He spoke words of thanksgiving. You know, it's good to, to speak words of thanksgiving. And, you know, one of the things God wants you to, to do, I believe, is, is actually speak out loud. I know that God can hear your thoughts. But he wants actually to hear your voice, not just your thoughts. I mean, sometimes I know what my wife is thinking. But it's a whole lot. I mean, it's, we don't just want to be like telepathic. And it's like, don't just spit it out. Say it. <laughs> we want to have a communication. We want to talk. God wants to talk with you. And so your thanksgiving, it's good to speak it out. Your praise, it's good to speak it out. And so Paul is saying, listen, because if you read his letters, one of the things he's, he recounts is, listen, I've gone through a lot of hardship for the call of God on my life. It hasn't, it hasn't been easy. There's been a lot of hardship. I've gone through shipwreck. I've gone through beatings. I've gone through a lot of different things. But I believe this gospel. And because I believe this gospel, I speak it. It's, the gospel is something that has to be spoken. I know we like to quote, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi who said, you know, um, in all things, uh, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. And I, and I totally get what that's trying to say. In other words, you can't, you can't have your words and your life be contradictory because what matters is what you do, not the words you say. But when the words that you say are consistent with the life that you live, you got to speak. The gospel has to be proclaimed. It has to be spoken verbally. And Paul says, listen, I know, I believe this good news. I believe the good news that that Jesus is Lord. I believe the good news that he's restoring the world. I believe that every human problem finds its solution in Jesus and faith in him. I believe that the injustices in the world can be made right by him. I believe that, that he is the one by the Spirit of God who is turning the world right side up. I believe that relationships get restored and marriages get, get restored. That's what the gospel says. 
I believe that those who are alone get brought into a family. That's what the gospel says. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, there's a place in the family of God for you. He says, I believe these things, therefore I speak them. And I go about declaring these things to anyone who will listen. I, he says, I even speak them just to the principalities. If a person won't listen to me, I'm just going to speak them into the air. I'm just going to speak them to the principalities over regions and just say, your time is limited. Your power has been demolished. I'm just going to speak them because I believe it to be true. That's what he's saying when he says this. And he's, and he's quoting David who, who did the same thing. Despite my affliction, I believe God. And I believe God is a rescuer and a deliverer and a healer. He's an overcomer. He's, he loves justice. And so I speak these things because I believe those things. And then God brings us into those very things, those things. Jesus said very clearly that what comes out of our mouth is an overflow of what is in our heart. That what comes out of our mouth is an overflow of your heart, of what's in your heart. And he actually compared your heart to a storehouse. So what he was saying was, what you have stored up in your heart eventually will come out your mouth. <clears throat> Do not think that things just come out of your mouth randomly. Oh, I didn't mean that when I said that. When I said that mean thing, well, you know, it was just a moment of whatever. No, it wasn't a moment of anger. In your moment of anger, you may have lost self-control, and so you didn't stop it from coming out of your mouth. But what came out of your mouth was because you had stored something up in your heart. When you speak a harsh word against someone, it's probably because you stored up bitterness in your heart towards them. And eventually it came out. What you store up in your heart, your speech, the way you talk, reveals what you have stored in your heart. Come on. Don't give me those eyes. Uh, don't throw your brow at me. I'm just, just, I'm just the messenger. I'm not even the messenger. I'm just reading you the scripture. Gossip. We talked about gossip in one of these, in one of these sessions. And gossip to me is just this. You're speaking about one person to another person in a way that's not edifying to anybody in that conversation or the person that you're talking about. That's basically what gossip is. All right? And so when you're gossiping, you are revealing what you have stored up in your heart. I can't believe so-and-so did so-and-so. When that resentment, that bitterness, that judgment, that condescension, that self-righteousness, whatever it is, you have been storing that up in your heart and now you need somebody to tell it to. <laughs> these things just don't just don't pop out there's a great story in the Bible that illustrates this I don't know if you've ever read the story of Aaron Aaron is Moses' brother and uh, there's a great story and uh, you know Moses at one point he brings the people out of Egypt and they're out in the wilderness and the desert it's not exactly a very fun time it's kind of a harsh environment and, and one time Moses goes up to the mountain to pray and, and to be with the Lord and he's up there for a long time 40 days actually and after a little while, the people are getting really kind of anxious. They're like, what happened to Moses? We don't know. He kind of disappeared. He went off. You know, and we don't know what happened to him. Maybe he's dead. We have no idea. And they were so used to um, having some kind of a physical representation of God uh, that when Moses wasn't there, and Moses had become, in a sense, their physical representation of God, and when he wasn't there, they were like, we need something. So they went to Aaron and said, let's build a golden calf that will represent the Lord to us and Aaron says okay uh, bring me all your gold and they bring all the gold and Aaron does his thing you know he melts it he forms it and he builds this golden calf and then Moses reappears he comes back down and he's like what is going on Aaron dude what a calf seriously really and Aaron does what we all tend to do I love Aaron's response listen he does what we all do when we get confronted with something we've done. He's like, 
I don't know what happened. I had all this gold. I threw it in the fire and out popped a calf. I don't know how that sin happened. It just kind of happened. It just popped out. That did not just pop out. <laughs> I love that. It's one of those awesome stories. I mean, not only is it hilarious, but it's like so true. It's just, you know what I mean? Like, listen, when you read the Bible, um, one of the things that should happen is you should see God more clearly and you should see yourself a little more clearly. Like, just read yourself into the stories in the Bible and you might discover something. <laughs> All right. Um, let's take a look at Luke. Luke uh, chapter one. It's a great, great story here. This is, uh, you may be very familiar with it. This has to do with Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, Luke chapter 1. Uh, I'm just going to look at verse 37 and 38. You may remember the story where Mary's a young girl, and she's engaged, and the uh, Lord sends an angel to her, says, guess what? You are about to get impregnated by the Holy Spirit. He's about to do a miracle in your womb, and you're going to bring forth the promised uh, servant of the Lord, the promised Messiah. And, um, and so uh, the angel speaks this, and then in verse 37, the angel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. That's how my translation has it. Okay, other ones might have it a little bit differently, but let me just kind of unpack that just real quickly for you. When you see for nothing, is that one up there? For nothing. Now, um, in the original language, it doesn't actually say nothing. What it says is no rhema. Now, if you're familiar with, if you've heard any teachings on this, rhema is the Greek word for, for word. And it actually generally speaks to the spoken word. It is the spoken kind of living word is what rhema tries to capture that idea. So it basically says no spoken word. And that impossible, let me tell you what impossible means. It, it actually means without strength, impotent, powerless, Weakly, disabled, unable to be done. And so he basically says, no spoken word will be impotent with God. No spoken word will be powerless with God. No spoken word will be weak with God. No spoken word will be unable to do what it's meant to do with God. That's what it means. Yeah, wow. And now notice Mary's response. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. Amen. All right? Which is basically what amen means. Amen. amen means let it be or so be it. It was actually, when the, for the Hebrews, when they said that, they were actually saying, <clears throat> everything in your word, let it be. Now, if you remember, in the old covenant, it was, if you will do these things, if you will keep the covenant with me, if you will listen to my voice and obey my voice, then all of these blessings will come upon you. And if you disobey and do not have faith, do not listen to my voice, then there's all these curses that will come. Not that God's gonna curse, it just means that that's the end result. When you don't, when you don't follow the Lord, when you don't follow the word, it was basically saying then you're, you're, you're going in a way contrary to the way he has designed the universe. I like to use the example of a plane. There's a reason why a plane can fly, even though we have the law of gravity, there's, a, there's another law called the law of lift, the aerodynamic law of lift. And when you design a plane according to the laws of, of aerodynamic lift, what does that plane do? Well, it flies. And when it flies, it's an amazing blessing. I can go from point A to point B 10 times faster than I could, you know, drive it. It's an awesome thing. But if that plane at any point decides to contradict the aerodynamic law of lift, what happens? Well, the law of gravity takes over. And kaboom, crash. That's kind of the picture. It's like when we listen and obey the voice of the Lord, the Old Testament said, 
than the way that God has ordered and designed this universe, the blessings, because he's designed it to be good, flow in our life, and when we contradict it, then, you know, the law of gravity, the law of curses takes over, so to speak. And so when the, when the Hebrew people said amen, they were saying amen to all of that. They were saying, let the blessings come when we obey and let the curses come when we disobey. <laughs> yeah. Can I have an amen? <laughs> okay, now, in case you're getting all worried and want to run out the door. We're not in the old covenant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, now I get an amen. We're in the new covenant. Okay, that does not mean anything goes. Okay, what the new covenant is, is you are now in Christ. You remember, remember the song we sang and the scripture that Kat read before that song says, all of God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. In Christ is the amen. In Christ. And so when you are in Christ, all right? This is why, by the way, um, you know, prophecy is such a powerful thing. And, 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 you know, Paul does write to the Corinthian church and he says, listen, uh, you really should uh, intensely and very earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. These are, these are empowerments, if you will. Gifts also means like empowerments. These are, these are things, the gifts that the Holy Spirit bestows upon people. And he says we ought to really earnestly, intensely desire these gifts for many reasons, one of which is because it's just part of who Holy Spirit is. And if you intensely desire Holy Spirit, you'd intensely desire the gifts that he bestows. Okay? But also because we need them. They're empowerments. But he says, even though you should intensely uh, uh, desire the spiritual gifts, you ought to especially intensely desire the gift of prophecy. Okay? Why is that the case? Because prophecy... The Bible says is the testimony of Jesus, meaning that it's basically this is the, this is how Jesus prophecy is meant to be a communication of how Jesus sees things, how he sees you, how he sees your future, how he sees your circumstances, how he sees the gifts he's put in you. It's how he has see how he sees. So it's the testimony. It's Jesus testifying over your life is what prophecy is meant to be, and the words are so powerful that when you receive those words and you begin to believe those words, and you begin to act on those words, then what God has spoken begins to happen in your life. Prophecy is not just some kind of automatic thing that happens. It's really more of an invitation into what is possible if you'll trust God. That's what prophecy is meant to be. It's meant to be an invitation. This is what is possible if you will believe me and follow me. This is how I see you. This is how I see your future. This is how I see the plans I have for you. Come and join me in that. Okay. Um, all right, I am running out of time. How did that happen so fast? Uh, so, um, that was interesting. I'll just take a few more minutes and I'll be done. Um, Jesus said this. He said, my, spirit, my, my words are spirit and life. My words are spirit and life. And of course, then he said some things that were very confusing to the disciples. And a bunch of his disciples actually said, that's... Yeah, I, this is too confusing for us. I don't get this. This is, this is you know, I'm, I'm out. And, uh, and, of course, Jesus was like, oh, please don't run away. Please don't go away. I'm sorry that I offended you. And uh, come back, and I'll, I'll say something different. No, he turned to the rest of the disciples and said, are you guys going to? <laughs> but listen to what his disciples said. They said this amazing thing. Okay, they said, where are we going to go? You have words of life. Okay, let me kind of put it into my own words. They're like, listen, we don't always understand what you're talking about, but when you talk, we come alive. I don't entirely get it. Sometimes I think I do, and then you tell me I'm wrong, but that's okay. What I do know is when you speak, I come 
alive. Now, now, could we just pause Selah for a second and just think about that for a minute? They were like, we don't always understand what you're saying, but when you talk, we know that we just come alive. So there's nowhere else we want to go. Think about that for a minute. What would it be like if people said that about our words? What if when we spoke, other people came alive and said, we're not entirely clear if we, if we understand everything you're talking about, but we do know something is happening inside of us that's amazing. I feel like there's power and there's life and I want what you're talking about, even though I'm not entirely sure if I get it. And by the way, almost nobody comes into the kingdom entirely understanding it. Matter of fact, you probably understand like such a small amount, it's, it's, it's pathetic. What, the, what got you in was that you felt life. You came alive. When the gospel was preached to you, you came alive. Amen. Something happened in you. It was like something is resonating with me. You came alive. And then you get to work out the implications of the gospel after you get to follow Doug. What? That's not what I signed up for. <laughs> I didn't know you meant that when you said that. You know, right? How many times has that happened to you? Like, what do you mean? It was every, everything? <laughs> I have to give it all? I don't get to hold on to anything? There's like, right? There's like nothing. There is no corner in your heart that Jesus won't go. All right. So, so this is why uh, the Bible uh, has... Throughout the entire Bible, it has um, one exhortation after another for us to exhort one another and to exhort yourself. Encourage yourself. If you haven't learned how to encourage yourself, then it's going to be really hard to encourage others. And probably the best example of this, and I'm almost there, the best example is an awesome story in the Bible. And by the way, this is what these stories are here for. The stories are there so we can learn these examples and learn these, these things. And the best example of this is the 12 spies. You may be familiar with the story. After, the, after coming out of Egypt and spending some time in the wilderness, and then God brings them to this promised land, this place he, he promised to give them. And, he, and Moses sends in 12 spies to just kind of check things out. And they come back. And then when they went there, they discovered, well, there's lots of people in, in there, and they're really big, and they're really strong. They're like twice our size and they're skilled at war and they have these huge instruments swords and stuff and and they come back and and 10 of the spies are are basically trying to talk themselves and trying to talk Moses and trying to talk the people out of doing what God said and then there were the two who said what are you talking about yeah we know they're big that's just more food they actually said they'll be food for us is what the the, the two said oh okay that's good. they're gonna be food for us Something about overcoming them that's going to nourish us. Yes. When was the last time you looked at an obstacle in your life or a difficulty or a challenge and said, wow, overcoming this is going to be nourishment to my soul. Yes. Some of you have heard Graham Cook talk about, uh, he talks about one time when his friend called and was like, yeah, I don't have any problems. Like, you don't have any problems in your life? I'm going to pray for you so you have a problem. We're so used to like calling up and asking people to pray for us not to have problems. It's like no problems, no food, no nourishment. Listen, I got news for you. You just haven't arrived yet. You are, I mean, there is a sense in which you are completed in Christ. All right, you are completed. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to like crucify the flesh and all that kind of stuff. And that, you know, as if you have to, as if what God started in you has to be completed by your own work and your own effort. Okay, that's not what I mean. But there is a sense in which the completed work that God has done in you is not being fully realized and expressed. And mostly it has to do with our perspective and our faith. And so having the obstacles, 
I'm not saying God wants you to have obstacles in your life. That's not what I mean. But I, what, what I mean is you live in a world full of obstacles and God doesn't want to just remove them. He wants to, these things to be overcome. That's the whole gospel message is that we're overcoming the problems. And in doing so, it's actually nourishing to you because you're learning what it means to be an overcomer. You're learning what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. You're not looking at a giant and thinking, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. You're thinking, looking at a giant and saying, with God, this becomes nourishment to me. And so the 10 spies tried to talk themselves out and tried to talk everybody else out of it. But the two, all right? And so, you know, talking yourself out of things, talking about why you're uh, not able to do something is not humility. Amen. It's not humility. Thinking you're unable, thinking you can't do things, thinking poorly about yourself is not an act of humility. Amen. Now, there is an act of honesty that says, apart from Christ, I can do nothing. But humility says, in him, I can do all things. So there's nothing that we should, when we, when, we, when we talk ourselves out of things, all we're doing is we're magnifying and elevating the problems above God. Even in ourselves. Sometimes we just magnify our own inadequacy and weaknesses as if our weakness is somehow a hindrance to God when the Bible says, in your weakness, my strength will be made perfect. All right? So, um, I know, I'm, I'm getting the look. Um, two more minutes, and if you, yeah, and the, and the parents can run out and grab their kids very, very quickly here, but just one more thing. So, because um, it's so important, you know, again, we have to, uh, we have to, uh, faith is sort of like us saying yes to God. It's our, it's our yes. It's our saying yes. I, I believe your perspective and what you're saying. And so it, we have to act that out in a sense. We have to begin to live that. And speaking plays such an important part of that. One of the ways in which we uh, cooperate with God, if you will, one of the ways in which we see the will of God come to pass is by speaking it. Okay? And start by speaking it over yourself. I want to just encourage you to learn how to encourage yourself. There's something actually just powerful about, about taking God's promises. Take the word of God. I mean, this is, this, there's a reason why God preserved this at the cost of many lives. He preserved this word because they're, 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 they're life. And you can, this is the more sure word of prophecy. These are, the, these are the prophetic words that have already been tested and tried and proven that they are the word of God. And speak them over your life. Look yourself in the mirror. This is a great exercise. Look at yourself in the mirror and then declare over, your, over yourself, who you are in Christ. Declare who God wants you to be today. Out loud. All right? And then do the same thing for one another. That's what it means to encourage one another and exhort one another is we see God in others and we call that forth. We see the destiny of God in others and we speak it forth. It is so easy, you know, they say that uh, the average person has tens of thousands of thoughts a day and that uh, most of those thoughts, 80% or sometimes higher, are negative thoughts. They're just negative thoughts and they're, all, they're usually focused on what we're incapable of doing or what is wrong with us and our flaws. So you can see why the Bible has such an encouragement to be speaking to one another because there's so much negativity in your own head. Um, you actually see an example of this in Psalm 42. All right, David actually speaks to himself. He actually, he actually talks himself into, he's, he's, he's depressed and he's discouraged. And in that Psalm, he talks to himself and he talks himself out of being discouraged and depressed. One of my favorite phrases, I learned this from one of my favorite people, Veronica. I remember one time I was talking with her and she was going through a hard time and she goes, but I just preach myself happy. I was like, I love that. I've been using that phrase ever since. She's like, I just preached myself happy. And uh, that's so powerful. So preach yourself happy. Preach yourself encouraged. Preach yourself full of hope. 
Uh, last scriptures from Joshua. I know I'm, I'm getting in big trouble, but but you're going to benefit from my pain. So <laughs> the last scripture is from uh, Joshua one, and of course Joshua is one of those great uh, heroes in the Bible, and he's the one that actually brought the people into the promised land. By the way, his name. Uh, and Jesus are the same name. Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, which is Joshua. He's a wonderful picture of Jesus in the Bible. And, and the Lord, as he's getting ready, Moses has died and Joshua's gonna be the leader. And the Lord says to him, now, be, now you be strong and you be courageous, Amen. right? That's a good word, right? Um, would you like to know, because the Lord didn't just tell him to do it, he actually told Joshua how to do it. Would you like to know what the Lord told Joshua? Mark, can you put up Joshua 1.8? Ooh, there's the whole thing. You've got to kind of run down and... Uh, um, this. Yes, all right. So do you have it in the NIV? Is it, can, it be, can it be quick? Ah, there we go. I love this. Uh, okay, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. It actually says lips. Do not let it depart from your lips. Now he says meditate on it day and night. Does anyone know what that word meditate means? You've probably heard ponder, like chew, like a... Um, that's actually not entirely t- true. It actually means to, to roar or to murmur or to mutter. Okay, which sometimes is what happens when a cow eats. And the Hebrew people, oftentimes, when they would when they would recite the word of God, they would they would mutter under their breath, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, love the Lord with all your heart, and all your mind, and all your soul." They would speak it out in other words. So that meditate actually it does mean to ponder, but it means to but it means that you're 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 pondering it so intensely that it's coming out of your mouth. You're making noise. So, do not let it depart from your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Mutter. <laughs> so that you may be careful to do what is written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. All right? So we need to have it always on our lip. We need to speak forth the word of the Lord. We need to mutter it, meditate, consider it so intensely it's, it's, it's coming out of our mouth. Like when, you know, what, what's in your heart, what you store up in your heart. When you store the word of God in your heart, you just begin to mutter it everywhere. It just comes out. And because, he says, when you have it on your lips and when you're meditating on it, so that you can be careful to do everything written in it. It's not a command. It's basically saying, listen, when it's on your lips and when it's in your heart, then you will do everything that is in it and you will be prosperous. Come on, isn't that good? All right. I got to the end a little bit late. Uh, Why don't we just stand and pray and parents, uh, right after this, why don't you head on down and grab your kids, relieve the teachers. Uh, The Missions Cafe will be open and I'll be in the back. If there's anybody here new, I'd love to just meet you. All right, Father, we just thank you for our time together and uh, Lord, we just say yes and amen to your word. We know that our words matter as well. And so, Father, would you, just by your grace, uh, continue to help us to store up good things in our heart. Let our heart be full of the good treasure. And that what may come out of our mouth would be reflective of the good treasure that you have placed within us. Amen and amen. Thank you for coming this morning. God bless. Grab your kids.